A journalist visiting America in 1860 wrote, There are several kinds of power working at the fabric of this republic. Water power, steam power, and Irish power. The last works hardest of all. Irish Americans continue to power America, from building our infrastructure, to healing the sick, to rushing into harm's way as others run out. Irish names are prominent on all our rolls of valor, including 257 recipients of the Medal of Honor that list Ireland as their birthplace. Without Irish Americans, Helen Keller would not have had her miracle worker. The marginalized would have lost a voice. We would not have been challenged to reach for the moon. But the most significant contribution of Irish Americans is the story of a people who arrived from their homeland with little more than energy and determination, who have contributed and excelled in every aspect of American society, defining the American dream. March is Irish American Heritage Month. Well, thank you, Neil Cosgrove, for the production of that wonderful Irish American Heritage Month video, and Chris Cook for getting us started tonight, our, our uh, IT uh, department extraordinaire. And welcome, everyone, to another installment of the Ancient Order Hibernians in America Irish American Heritage Month webinar series. Tonight, we will hear from one of our current members talking about one of our past members of the AOH, Father Flanagan, who created Boys Town. I would be remiss if I didn't first mention our eventful St. Patrick's Day. In addition to the incredible masses, parades, luncheons, giant flags, dinners, you name it, we had three national success stories as well. House Resolution 888, addressing the justice issues in North Ireland, initiated by Division 9 in Plymouth, Massachusetts, was passed unanimously by the House of Representatives letting the British government know the United States will not stand for amnesty proposals or anything that undermines a Good Friday Agreement. Thank you to all the members of the United States House of Representatives. Across the way, the United States Senate brought the E3 out of committee, giving Ireland another shot to roughly 5,000 professional visas a year. This breathes new life into our work on immigration between the U.S. and Ireland. Our hope is by the end of the year, we have a, a, a bilateral immigration agreement that allows these young professionals to come to the United States and it allows some of our uh, seniors who wish to retire in, in Ireland to be able to go there and join the Irish. And lastly, the AOH National Board unanimously passed a resolution in support of the people in the Ukraine. And we announced as part of that resolution, a national fundraising campaign in support of the refugees. What a big week it was for the ancient order Hibernians in America. That being said, please welcome our host, our national historian, Daniel Taylor. Dan, take it away. Thank you, Danny. And I, I too would like to welcome everyone to this, the third, of our Irish Heritage Month webinars for 2022. We began our series this year on March 5th with Professor Kean McMahon, who described the experience of that great wave of Irish immigrants who made the passage across the Atlantic in the mid 19th century in the wake of Angorta Moor, the Great Hunger. We continued the series on March 9th with Professor Jim Barrett, who gave us a fascinating look at how Irish immigrants paved the way for later immigrants and established a paradigm of assimilation that shaped a new urban American culture. Tonight, we have a program that promises to be rather uplifting uh, about one Irish immigrant of the early 20th century and his remarkable and enduring contributions to his community and to the country at large. Father Edward J. Flanagan was born in Ireland in 1886 and in 1904, like so many Irish men and women before him, arrived at Ellis Island. By 1912, he had earned bachelor's and master's degrees, attended seminary in Europe, and was ordained a priest in the Diocese of Omaha. Five years later, a young Father Flanagan founded a revolutionary residential facility for what we might now call at-risk boys in Omaha. 
eschewing the prevailing reform school model, Father Flanagan stressed education, enrichment, and understanding. 20 years later, Father Flanagan's reputation and the success of his, met of his methods inspired a blockbuster motion picture that is now part of the canon of the golden age of Hollywood, 1938's Boys Town, starring Spencer Tracy and a young Mickey Rooney. Father Flanagan passed in 1948, but Boys Town continues to be a place where young people, now boys and girls, are shaped and nurtured in a manner consistent with Father Flanagan's principles. In 2012, Father Flanagan was named a servant of God, a step along the way to canonization, and his cause for sainthood continues. Our guest tonight is an expert on all things Father Flanagan and Boys Town. Thomas J. Lynch has worked at Boys Town for over 35 years and currently serves as the director of the Boys Town Hall of History and Community Programs. Brother Lynch earned a degree in history from the University of Nebraska, and in 2012, he was appointed by Omaha Archbishop George Lucas to the Servant of God Edward Flanagan Cause for Canonization Historical Commission. Outside of Boys Town, Brother Lynch has served as the past president of the Nebraska Museums Association and as a board member for the Union Pacific Railroad Museum. Like Father Flanagan, uh, Brother Lynch is a member of our order and fittingly enough, a fourth generation member of the Omaha Father Edward Flanagan of Boys Town Division of the AOH. Uh, with that, I give you uh, Brother Thomas Lynch to tell us about Father Flanagan and Boys Town. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining me this evening to hear about Father Flanagan in his work in ministry, which continues here in Nebraska. I have a PowerPoint presentation that I'd like to show you and discuss Father Flanagan's life. And then if you have any questions, we can answer your questions about Father Flanagan, the work he did. Father Flanagan was born in Ballymo, Ireland in July 13, 1986. And this is an image of the home that he lived in and was born in. Uh, the home today is on someone's property. It's a uh, barn. But Father Flanagan lived in this little home with his mom and dad, brothers and sisters. He was the eighth of 11 children. 15 people lived in this little stone cottage with no electricity or running water. It had one window and one door, and Father Flanagan loved it. He described how he learned many of his concepts of being a, a member of a family from this living in this home. His mom and dad, John and Nora, were very devout and would, would pray with the children every day. And his dad was worked on the land of a landlord. He was a, like a, a groundskeeper, taking care of the land and the sheep for the uh, owner of the property, who was a British landlord. Uh, Father Flanagan was very weak when he was born. He was a very sickly baby. Uh, the, phys the midwife actually told his family, he's going to die in the night. Just put him by the fire and let him pass away. And the story goes, his grandfather Flanagan uh, rocked him next to the fire in this cottage and he survived. But then for the rest of his life, he had very poor health, especially he would have, uh, get pneumonia and have weakness in his lungs. So he would spend his days uh, in bed often being ill. And then when he was feeling well enough, he would go out in the fields and his job was to tend to sheep. And he'd take with him a Bible or a Dickens novel. And that's what he would do every day, go out and take care of the sheep in the field. Uh, and that was his responsibility as a member of the family. Uh, when he was ready to go to school, he went to German Temple School, which is about a mile from his home. So every day his mother would walk him and his brothers and sisters over to German Temple School. And this building is still standing outside the village of Ballymo. In fact, uh, we have some of our friends from Ballymo actually uh, joining us tonight. They said they would uh, try to uh, join us over in Ireland. Uh, this was the school Father Flanagan went to, and he did fairly well in school. He had some problems due to his health and missing school, but he always wanted to uh, further his education and strive to do that his entire life. This is an image of Ballymo, the village he was born in, uh, in 1904. Uh, you can see from the village, it was a farming community. Uh, in that time, it, they had around uh, two, 300 people live there, and that's about the same number that live in the village today. It was an agricultural community, and it was based around the local church, St. Crone's, where Father Flanagan worshipped as a child. After he finished his education in uh, Ballymo, he wanted to continue on, so his family sent him to Summerhill College in Sligo, and this is an image of the original school at Sligo. 
And in Sligo, Father Flanagan really got a shock of his life. He had grown up in the little tiny village of Ballymo with a close-knit group of people. And he describes on uh, going up by train and going into the town of Sligo, which was on the coast. And it was a harbor town. And there were all these different types of people in, in hustle and bustle. And he really wasn't used to it. And it really kind of shocked him at first when he got there. Uh, but once he was in school, he excelled. And he was very good at handball and became a handball champion at, at Summerhill College. And once he was finished with the college education or high school education there, it was time for him to decide what to do in life. And he always had the dream that he'd become a priest. So he went back to Ballymo to the cottage and asked his mom and dad if he could go to America and become a priest. And his older sister, Miss Nellie Flanagan, had already come to America and she was encouraging him to come. And his mom and dad uh, thought about it for the longest time and then finally agreed he could travel uh, to America to become a priest. And he would travel with his older brother, Patrick Flanagan. And this is actually an image of Father Flanagan on the boat arriving at Ellis Island. He's in the middle there with his cap on, with his hand on the dog. And next to him to his uh, right is his brother, Patrick, with his cap on. And Patrick Flanagan was a priest and was coming to Omaha, Nebraska to found a parish because at that time, Omaha was considered a pioneer community, and we had a local archbishop who was Irish, and he was bringing brand new Irish priests from uh, Dublin and all over Ireland to come and open uh, parishes in Omaha, Nebraska. So he followed his big brother to come to the city of Omaha, and their older sister, Miss Nellie, came with them. So they moved to the city of Omaha. Uh, but before they moved there, again, he landed at Ellis Island, and he had another shock of his life at coming into New York City. Uh, and meeting all these different people in different cultures uh, once he was there. And it took him a while to adjust to coming to America and starting his new life. And then eventually he made it to Omaha. Once he was in Omaha and he agreed he, he wanted to go to become a priest, the Archdiocese of Omaha accepted him. So he went to Mount St. Mary's College in Maryland for get his BA degree in 1906. And we do have his school records there. And they write, uh, one of his professors wrote, he's a very nice little Irishman. Uh, he talks a lot and has some strange ideas. And he should go back to Nebraska and be with his brother because they're so desperate. They'll take anybody in Nebraska. So it just kind of shows Father Flanagan, even at that time, people were not looking at him as contributing to society. He was just considered someone with too many questions, too many ideas that would never succeed. Uh, but he loved being at, at Mount St. Mary's. And then uh, from there, he decided... Uh, on a seminary to go to, and he picked St. Joseph's Seminary in Dunwoody, New York, right outside New York City. So Father Flanagan went to the seminary, was again, was doing well there, but then he had heard uh, from uh, people and his relatives who live in the city about Hell's Kitchen. And in Hell's Kitchen, uh, there were fellow immigrants like himself that were dying alone in the hospitals. So Father Flanagan began a hospice program where he would go into Hell's Kitchen and go to the hospitals there to be with the fellow immigrants who were alone so they would not die alone. And from this work, he actually overextended himself due to his, his poor physical uh, health. And he developed pneumonia and eventually had to leave Dunwoody and come back to Omaha after just a short stay there. But when he was in New York City, he witnessed Hell's Kitchen and the homeless children there. And it really affected him to see all these different children living on the streets and no one taking care of them. Uh, and then the horrible stories of what was happening to the children with abuse and uh, dying of starvation. It was all uh, part of his psyche to want to help these kids. And people often say to us, where did Father Flanagan come up with his ideas to help children? It began with his childhood in Ireland, uh, witnessing uh, at, when it was under Irish uh, English occupation. And he heard the stories from his grandfather of what had happened during the famine and how people had died in the family and then surrounding communities. And he saw for himself the oppression, the poverty of one small group of people owning everything. So that plus being in New York City's Hell's Kitchen all began to create in him an idea, especially the concept, everyone is equal, no matter who they are, it's discrimination against anyone was wrong. And that was all building from his Irish experience in being in New York City. After he came back to Omaha, he, he rested for a while and decided he would continue on his education. And he went to uh, Gregorian University in Rome. And he arrived, he was really excited to be in Rome and, and uh, to be there. This is an, actually an image of Father Flanagan with some of the yellow fellow seminarians when they went to Venice. And he was doing great. But then again, after a few months uh, over exertion and then the, the damp climate in Rome, he developed pneumonia again. And he was unable to fulfill his dream to become a, a priest there. So he had to come back to Omaha, Nebraska. So he failed at another seminary. 
And when he came back home to Omaha, his family said, uh, well, you, you got to get a job. So then he went to work in a meatpacking plant here in the city of Omaha. And he was a bookkeeper for about a year or two in, the, in uh, Cudahy Meatpacking Plant in the city of Omaha. But he always had that dream that he wanted to be a priest. So after a year or two, he went back and spoke to his brother and the archbishop and said, I'd like to try again. And that's when his brother said, you should go to Innsbruck, Austria. And that's where Father Flanagan went into Innsbruck. And that eventually that's where he was ordained. And being in the clean mountain air in Innsbruck, we believe really helped his health. And when he was there, he worked in the bookstore. Book and so he helped to uh, sell books to earn extra money. And he traveled throughout Germany. Uh, and eventually Father Flanagan was fluent in German, in Latin, in, in English. And he met fellow Americans that were there at the university and, and created lifetime friendships. And that's where Father Flanagan was eventually ordained. While he was there, he loved the mountain climb. So this is an image of Father. He's the last one there in, in the group mountain climbing. Uh, and uh, that's a hobby he picked up. And for the rest of his life, he loved to go hunting and, and hiking, uh, especially fishing was a hobby that he picked up while he was there. That's something he learned in Ireland too, fishing in a stream outside his family's home. He was ordained in, in 1912, and then he, uh, as being a priest of the Archdiocese of Omaha, he came back to, uh, to serve in Omaha, and his first parish was selected was a community called O'Neill, Nebraska. And O'Neill, Nebraska is a rural community uh, founded by Irish people back at the turn of the century. And this is an image of Father Flanagan. He's on the far, which would be your left there with his cap on, with some of the people in, from the parish. And it reminded him of his hometown of Ballymoe, Ireland. It was a small rural community. Everyone worked together as a unit. Uh, they were helping each other. Uh, he was there through blistering summers and blizzards. And from the stories we hear, the people in the community really loved Father Flanagan. They loved his sermons, his care that he showed everyone, and he was making an impact in that community. Uh, I would just like to add O'Neill, Nebraska is named for General O'Neill. And the General O'Neill was an Irish patriot that uh, eventually came to Nebraska and he invaded Canada. His goal was to invade Canada and force the English to uh, uh, come to uh, support Canada. And then the Irish could uh, lead an uprising. And unfortunately, it didn't work. Uh, but then General O'Neill is born, is buried here in the city of Omaha. And every year, the Hibernians here, we honor his grave as an Irish patriot. So Father Flanagan was in O'Neill, Nebraska, and he was called to the city of Omaha to serve a parish. So he came to the city of Omaha in 1913 to go to work at St. Pat Patrick's Parish. And it's unique within his lifetime, almost every parish Father Flanagan served at was named St. Patrick's. And at St. Patrick's here in the city of Omaha, this church was in a working uh, class neighborhood, uh, blue collar area. And one day on the steps in front of this church, he saw these men. And he went to talk with these men and discovered they were working poor. These were men that could not make enough money working in the meatpacking plants and in the factories to have a decent place to live. So Father Flanagan tried to help these men. He gave them money and gave them food, but he realized that wasn't succeeding. So he decided he would work with the St. Vincent de Paul Society and open up shelters for these men. Unfortunately, this church was torn down not too long ago, but in the picture there, you can see that round window in the middle. That's the original window from the church that is saved. And we have it on display here in the Hall of History Museum. So guests can stop by and see that. Father Flanagan worked with St. Vincent de Paul Society to open eventually three, what he called Working Men's Hotel. And these were unique facilities where men could come and have a decent place to live. He had an employment agency. The one thing he told the men was, you make your rules how you want to live. My rule is you must welcome any man who comes to the door regardless of race, religion. All men were welcome to come and live in these shelters. And Father Flanagan's shelters at first worked very well, but then over a period of time, a different type of men started to come in. These were men that had drug and alcohol problems, psychological problems. They really didn't want his help. They wanted just some place to flop. Father Flanagan was physically assaulted several times while, while working in the shelters. And he finally did a case study of over 2,000 of the men living there. He said, why are you living in this shelter? And they all had the same story. When they were younger, their families broke up. Nobody wanted them. They had no education, no training, and they just began to drift from job to job, city to city. So Father Flanagan decided that he was working at the wrong end of, end of the spectrum because within the city of Omaha, there were homeless children that were coming into his shelters, and he decided he needed to work with homeless kids. So what he did was he went to our Douglas County Courthouse in Omaha, sat in a juvenile court. And even today, if you go to your local community and, and sit in a juvenile court and witness what happens, it's amazing to see the stories of the kids. And in the courtroom, he discovered that infants and toddlers would go to orphanages. 
Young ladies and girls would go to families who wanted made their servants. Nobody wanted these boys. So your pre-teenage boys or teenage boys, there was no advocate for these children. Nobody wanted them. So that's when Father Flanagan decided, I'm going to be the advocate for the children that nobody wants. And that's basically what we still do at Boys Town today. We work with children who families and society have turned their backs on. And that began with Father Flanagan. He, at the courthouse in, in Omaha at the time, everything was segregated by race or religion. Father Flanagan worked with the Irish children. And at the courthouse, he met a gentleman named Mr. Henry Monsky, who worked with Jewish children. And he discussed with Mr. Monsky his idea of setting up a program to help these boys. So Mr. Monsky, we believe, donated the $90 to open Boys Town. And then he would go on and work pro bono for Boys Town for many years uh, till 1947, his death. And they were very close friends. And this is an image of the first home Father Flanagan rented. It was an old boarding house eventually in the city of Omaha built by a gentleman named Mr. Byron Reed. Father Flanagan rented this building uh, for uh, $90 and moved in. He made a radical statement when he opened the doors. He said, I'm gonna welcome any child regardless of race or religion to come live with me. And he said, I'm gonna be independent. He, so he took no funding from the Catholic church or the community chest. Cause he said, if I take money from these organizations they're gonna put parameters and how I can work with children. And I'm gonna create a whole new revolutionary program on working with kids. And so I wanna be free and independent. So when he opened the doors, all boys were welcome to come and live in the, at Boys Town. And this is an image of some of the early kids that come to live with them. Uh, he had kids coming from the court system. People were just driving up, dropping off children. Boys were just pouring in the doors. And he was overwhelmed with the number of boys that were coming to him uh, that uh, needed a new home to live. So he rented an old German American home, which is here in the city of Omaha. It was closed down during World War I. Father Flanagan moved in there in 1918. You can kind of see an image down there on the corner there. That's Father Flanagan, some of the boys and some of the nuns that came to help him. He had different orders of nuns and volunteers from throughout the city who came forward to help take care of the kids. Uh, and this building worked well for Father Flanagan for a while, but then eventually he needed more space. This is a unique image Father Flanagan had created in 1920. And it shows all the different races of the boys that lived with them at the time. And then the city of Omaha, again, at that time was a very segregated city. And just in 1920, there had been a lynching in downtown Omaha. A gentleman, African-American, had been killed in front of our courthouse. And they attacked our mayor as a terrible event that took place. And Father Flanagan was uh, fighting against that. He believed in uh, there should be no discrimination due to a person's race or religion, all based, again, on what he had witnessed growing up in Ireland and the discrimination that he had witnessed as a child. Uh, so that was one of his major tenets when he created Boys Town and we still follow today. All children are welcome. When he was at the German American home in 1920, Imon de Valera was touring across America to raise money for Irish independence. And Father Flanagan was a major champion for Irish independence. That's what he talked about all the time was having a free Ireland. So this is an image taken on the front steps of our German American home uh, with uh, Iman de Valera in the middle. And he had two uh, cardinals traveling with him from Australia, two archbishops. And then standing next to him is Bishop Hardy. And that's the gentleman that uh, allowed Father Flanagan to open Boys Town. He was an Irish bishop from the city of Omaha. And our Father Flanagan is kind of standing over there on the left. And you can see all the boys. I kind of like this image because you can see the boys all are barefoot because it's summertime. So the boys wouldn't be wearing their, sh their shoes. And Father Flanagan made a lifelong friendship with Mr. Uh, Iman de Valera until uh, the day he died in 1948, they would correspond back and forth and work together uh, on Irish projects. So he was a great champion of Irish independence. He was at the German American home and then eventually German American society said, you gotta move on and we wanna reopen. Well, everywhere he went in the city of Omaha to move, nobody wanted him because he had all these different children of races, religions living together that he went into communities and people objected. And we actually had newspaper articles, people writing petitions telling them they weren't wanted. So he decided I'm gonna leave the city of Omaha and go 10 miles west. And that's what he did in 1921. He purchased our current location of Boys Town called Overlook Farm. And he purchased 160 acres and moved out here. And you can see the image there of the original farm. It's kind of hard to see, but in that image, there's a windmill. And that windmill is now on display here in our Hall of History Museum. But Father Flanagan loved this property. It was way out in the country. It had an existing farm. It reminded him of his growing up in Ireland and the farm he had grown up on. He was free and independent here. No one could object to him taking care of all the kids and they could live their lives and be free and independent. And he loved the name Overlook. And we just had a new street created here in the village of Boys Town. And the children all voted to name it Overlook in honor of the, the original farm. 
And this is moving day. The boys got to move out from the original building to our new, uh, new location. And it was, uh, uh, again, a long way. So this is a picture of the little boys. Father could only afford to rent one truck. So all the little boys got to ride on the truck as they moved to their new home. The older boys had to walk the 10 to 15 miles from uh, the old home out to their new home. And we, we have newspaper articles describing a long line of little boys carrying their suitcases heading west out of the city of Omaha. And so Father Flanagan was basically uh, kicked out of the city of Omaha. Nobody wanted him because of his revolutionary ideas. And on the farm, there's an image of one of the kids working. He loved it. They could feed themselves. You can see from the distance how open it was. And that's what was he loved about it. They're free and independent and they could grow their own food and they wouldn't have to worry about anyone bothering them because he did have run-ins with the Ku Klux Klan several times objecting to his ideas. He built our first building here back in 1923, the Omaha building. And this building stood here for many years on the campus. He wanted large, substantial brick buildings for the kids. And that's what we still have today here in the village of Boys Town. And what made his, his child care uh, concept so unique was that he uh, wanted the kids to be treated as individuals. He started a traveling show that would travel across the Midwest and raise money for the home. Uh, he had a local band leader, an African-American gentleman named Mr. Dan Des Dunes, come out and teach kids how to sing and dance, put on shows. And they would take these shows across the state in Nebraska, and they're doing great to the hit of town. The Ku Klux Klan was active, and they would not, not allow Father Flanagan to perform because he was Catholic and the boys being mixed races. So Father Flanagan brought him back to the village of Boys Town, but eventually they were traveling by train across America putting on these shows. He loved the technology. So in the 1920s, he began his own radio program called Links of Love. And Links of Love was an idea of bringing uh, people to want to help homeless children. Because at that time in America, homeless kids, often children had gotten into trouble, were considered beyond help. And that's the boys that were coming to them. Their families, again, had turned their backs on them. Society, uh, they were considered not worthy to be assisted or helped. So he wanted people to have love for the children uh, that were homeless. And today at Boys Town, we still have a campaign called Love. And that uh, goes back to this Father Flanagan concept. But he was using this radio program to spread his ideas and concepts across America. And uh, they were very revolutionary concepts. He would take the traveling band and they'd travel across America again. They'd go up and visit the president, uh, President Coolidge, when he'd be in South Dakota. They'd go up and they made an annual trip. They'd go out and, and perform for him. And he became a supporter of Father Flanagan's ideas and concepts. Uh, back in 1927, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig were traveling across America, and they came out to Boys Town to visit Father Flanagan. And when Babe Ruth saw the village of Boys Town, it reminded him of where he had grown up, his orphanage in Baltimore, Maryland, and he became a lifetime supporter of Father Flanagan. And in our museum here, we have autographed baseballs from Babe Ruth. And we have the, uh, Babe Ruth, when he was passing away from cancer, he made one final trip out in the mid-40s to Boys Town to say goodbye to Father Flanagan and the boys. And uh, so he was a very good friend and supporter of uh, Boys Town, as was Lou Gehrig. Lou Gehrig, Gehrig's widow sent us a bust of uh, him that's still on display here in our Hall of History Museum. Uh, and they were good supporters of Boys Town. There was always the concept uh, people had in the 20s and 30s of all these homeless kids roaming around uh, call it homelessness. And it was like a romance. These kids were having the best time of their lives. And Father Flangan knew the truth. The boys would come to him and tell him horrible stories of being exploited, factories and mines and, and physical and sexual abuse. So Father Flangan knew that was a false concept. And he always talked about how new programs had to be created to help these boys and to start on new lives. And they couldn't just not be ignored because Father Flangan said our youth are our future and the way we treat them is uh, eventually they're going to take care of us. So we have to treat them well. He hated reform schools. And he would travel across America, try to shut down every single reform school because he went into reform schools and witnessed what happened there. And he saw the physical abuse from kids. And even now in America today, they're, uh, they're digging up uh, graves outside of reform schools where children died and were just buried in mass graves or unnamed graves behind the facilities. So he took it as his job to go across America and shut down every single reform school and create programs like Boys Town where kids could have an education and spiritual life and be taught a trade. His concept was there is no bad boys. And it basically said a child is not born bad. It's what happens to that child, uh, causes that child to act out. If they have poor parenting role models, if they're physically, sexually abused, uh, that child is going to act out. And so Father Flanagan used that statement to say these children needed help. And what was revolutionary about his program was when children came to Boys Town, they were treated again as an individual and Father Flanagan would allow no physical abuse or no verbal abuse. And even today at Boys Town, as an employee, if I yell at a child or I, I would to hit a child, I'd be instantly dismissed. 
because Father Flang had said you had to use love and in uh, behavior modification. And that's what he preached when he created Boys Town. It was very, very rev revolutionary for its time back in 1917 through the 1930s. And he had great opposition. Many people said these kids needed to be locked up and put behind bars. And he had no locked doors at Boys Town, no bars on the windows. It functioned just as a family. And then we still function that way today too. He said, everyone who comes here, all the children are part of the family. And that's how they had to be treated with love and respect. Uh, the movie Boys Town came out in 1938, uh, some people from Hollywood heard about Father Flanagan's work, came and visited and said, we'd like to make a movie. Uh, the movie was a smash hit. Father sold the rights for $5,000. So even today, we do not own the rights to it. It's been bought by Amazon. Now they own the rights to the movie Boys Town. But the impact of the movie was major on Boys Town. It went out across the United States, around the world, and people saw the movie. And we still have letters in our archives where people wrote saying the movie inspired them to go and start their own youth care programs. There are several men that causes to be saints are underway. One of them saw the movie as a 10 year old and that inspired him to go to Mexico and, and, and open up children's home. So it had a major impact on Father Flanagan. It made him a national international figure in, in childcare. And Spencer Tracy won the Oscar for the movie Boys Town. He gave it to Father Flanagan the next day and we have it on display here in our Hall History Museum. Uh, the Oscar, he was the first actor to win consecutive Best Actor Awards. And both Spencer Tracy and Mickey Rooney became supporters of Boys Town after that uh, for many years. And Mickey Rooney, till he died, he was in his 80s, 90s, was still doing special events for Boys Town. Even though we do have some donors wrote to us, a couple of them saying, I don't want to give you any money because I don't like the way uh, Mickey Rooney turned out as an adult. And we had to say, we had nothing to do with them as an adult. He just came and uh, was in the movie Boys Town. But it was a huge event when it took place and, uh, and helped Boys Town expand. Father Flanagan became a national figure in youth care. He would travel across America advising uh, different organizations and cities and counties. Uh, and then eventually President Roosevelt called him in to help with uh, efforts with children. He sat on national boards dealing with children uh, based in Washington, DC. And on one of his visits to the White House with visiting President Roosevelt, he stated America needed 49 more Father Flanagans, one for every state and territory. And it's amazing to see Father Flanagan in 1917 was this Irish immigrant priest that no one had ever heard of. And just 20 years later, he's sitting in the White House and the president is saying, we must follow this, this, this gentleman's ideas and concept. His ministry is a role model on how children should be treated, not just in America, but around the world. And it's amazing to see, especially after the movie, Father Flang was gone from Boys Town for many months every year, touring and visiting with different or organizations, just not in America, but around the world. And many people came to Boys Town to learn from Father Flanagan. One of them was uh, uh, several saints, uh, who gentlemen who are saints now, who came from Latin America, visited with Father Flanagan, went back, created their, pro uh, their programs, and have now been canonized. So uh, we figure on our property, we had St. Teresa here too, of Calcutta. We've had six or seven saints walk on our property here in the village of Boys Town uh, since its inception. Uh, back uh, in the 1940s, Father Flang had really wanted to expand Boys Town. During the Great Depression, he had to turn boys away when they come to the door, and that really hurt him. So he said, I'm going to create a village for a thousand boys. So what you see right here is an image of what our village looked like in about 1940. And in the middle of the village, there's a little, little uh, small building. That's the Hall of History. That's what I'm sitting in right now in my office here in the museum. And in the background, you can see the older, larger buildings that were here in place. And in front, there's four new dormitories that were built back for the kids in about 1939. And the building under construction in the bottom corner there is our Dowd Catholic Chapel. And that was donated by Miss Marie Dowd in New York City. She saw the movie and gave Father Flanagan uh, money to create a chapel. And this was just the beginning of the expansion because Father Flanagan saw this and said, I want to have a thousand boys here. So he began the process of buying land and expanding the village. And just before World War II hit, he had to stop the project because once the war hit, everything stopped in construction across America. But his idea and dream did not stop. He still wanted to help kids. And it's unique, too. You can see a farm up at the top. That's our Boys Town farm that used to produce food for our kids. Uh, and we actually just sold that in the last few years because we no longer have an agricultural program because we're an urban campus now. During World War uh, II, Father Flang was named America's number one war dad because hundreds of boys list them as their only next to kin. We have around 800 boys that we know of listed Father Flanagan, uh, and he, uh, 35 of them died, again, that we know of. This is a flag presented to Father Flanagan by the city of Baltimore, because Father Flanagan would take our football teams across the country, and whenever Boys Town came to town for football, it was a huge event. 
uh, they'd have 40, 50,000 people turn out. So this is in Baltimore, Maryland, when the boys came to play football and the city presented them with this flag. And we had this flag in our collection here in the, at the Hall of History. We actually shared it with the state of Nebraska. They had it at the State Historical Museum uh, not too long ago when they did a, a display on World War II because Father Flanagan uh, was a great advocate for America. He did war bond drives. He raised about five to $8 million on war bond drives across America. And, and President Roosevelt and the Attorney General appointed him to commissions to see what the impact of the war was having on families across America. So he sat on that national commission for the president. Uh, and on that commission, he met members of the Kennedy family, Eunice Kennedy and eventually John, John Kennedy. And in our Hall of History Museum, we have, uh, while England slept, uh, the book John Kennedy wrote, uh, autographed from him. It was, he gave it to Father Flanagan and we have it here in the Hall of History collection. After World War II, Father Flanagan wanted to do something to help the war orphans because he realized there were going to be children that needed assistance. So he wrote to President Roosevelt uh, and eventually then President Truman took him up on that offer saying he would go on this mission to work with war orphans uh, in uh, first Asia and then Europe. And in 1947, Father Flanagan began that mission and he went to Japan and Korea and he witnessed uh, just the total devastation and the thousands, if not uh, millions of children that were homeless and needed help. And he traveled extensively during this trip. He was gone for almost three months on this presidential mission. And it's unique because Father Flanagan that we know of is the only religious of any faith in America's history to be appointed by a president of the United States to go and represent the United States on a mission around the world. And this was a presidential mission. And he, uh, he eventually uh, went to Korea and then he went to Japan. And then he went to the Philippines also. And this is an image of father with some of the uh, orphans that he saw in the Philippines. And those countries were not intended on the initial mission, but once they heard father was coming, they, it was requested he uh, join, uh, go to those countries. And in Japan, he met with Douglas MacArthur and worked with MacArthur. And he met with the emperor and empress of Japan too, and worked with Japanese individuals. We have his daily list and it's amazing to see every day he'd visit three to four different orphanages and government commissions on this trip. So it was a very extensive trip that he went on, very exhausting uh, for him. And uh, his health was not too well. And so he was totally exhausted by the time he returned to America. And in 1947, he went to the White House and presented his report to President Truman. It's called The Children of Defeat. And this was his documentation on how the children in Japan could be assisted after the war in the Philippines and Korea. President Truman took this report, shared it with the Japanese government. And in Japan today, the basis of the child labor laws are still based on this report that Father Plan created. Uh, and within our Hall of History collection too, we have different letters and documents from people from all over Japan, Philippines and Korea that wrote to Father Flanagan uh, asking his help in creating other boys towns and assisting him. Because eventually from these trips, over 96 boys towns were created around the world and we do not directly operate them. They're inspired by us because our mission is to serve the children of America. But the most recent one to open it, it just opened in Pakistan about three years ago. So boys towns are still opening around the world based on Father Flanagan's work. President Truman said, Father, you did so great in Asia. Could you please go to Europe? And Father Flanagan said he would, even though his health at that point was very poor, but he felt he had to go at the request of the president. So he traveled to Europe in 1948. He went to Austria and on that stay in Austria, he was in Vienna. There was actually several bomb, uh, bombs exploded near his hotel. And we have letters writing he was very fearful of being in Vienna because of uh, at that time, again, he was pre representing President uh, Truman and the Soviets who were occupying part of Austria were actually looking for him. And he had trouble with them on a train. Soviet soldiers stopped him on a train at one point. And from the drive from the, the city to the airport, uh, he was told if your car breaks down, you're probably going to be arrested by the Soviets. So Father Flanagan was very scared on that trip, but he had to go there to see the children and help them because he had gone to school and, and lived in Austria at, as uh, during the seminary. So he loved the Austrian people and wanted to go help them. While he was in Austria too, the Pope asked him to come down to the Vatican to work with him. He wanted to create a concordat between the, the Austrian church and the Catholic church again, the Vatican. So Father Flank worked on that mission for the Pope when, on this, uh, when he was there in Austria. His final uh, mission took him from Austria to Germany. And this is the final image of Father taken a few hours before he died. He actually had suffered a heart attack in Vienna saying Easter mass and he should have stopped, but he kept right on going because he wanted to help the kids there. And finally, in, in Berlin, Germany, he suffered a massive heart attack at, at age 62. And when he passed away, it's a great shock for everyone. 
uh, because Boys Town, again, he created it as a non-sectarian children's home, which remained today. And many people assume when Father Flan died, Boys Town would close. But luckily, the home stayed open through the good work of our directors and our staff. But when Father Flan passed away in Berlin, he always said he wouldn't be buried at, at uh, Boys Town. So President Truman has remains brought back to Boys Town. It took uh, three, three flights to bring him to uh, finally to uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and then to be buried here in our chapel. Uh, but President Truman requested that take place. And two days after his funeral, President Truman came to Boys Town, laid flowers on Father Flanagan's tomb. And we think that's a very great honor because again, if any, to have a president recognize anyone of any faith like that is uh, religious is very, uh, very important. This is an image of Father Flanagan's funeral at the chapel here at Boys Town, the Dow Chapel. And that's his brother, Patrick, saying his uh, funeral mass here in the village of Boys Town. Uh, over 25,000 people attended the services. They had to have two or three different services take place uh, when Father Flanagan passed away. This is his tomb in the village of Boys Town today. This was created by our, our third director, Father Robert Hupp, in honor of Father. And on top of his tomb, it's kind of hard to see, but in honor of his Irish heritage, there's Celtic knot design going throughout the top of his tomb. And in bronze, it's Father Flanagan's life from his birth in, in Ballymo, Ireland, to his death in Berlin, Germany. And uh, this is visited by our boys and girls. Every new boy and girl who comes to our village, gets a tour of campus, and they learn where Father's tomb is. And it's not uncommon to see our boys and girls in there and former boys and girls in just the public praying in Father Flanagan's tomb. This is an image of what the village of Boys Town looks like today. And today we are completely surrounded by the city of Omaha. We have over 300 boys and girls living with us. We are one of the largest residential care facilities in America. And these are children aged about nine to 18. And they're coming here for treatment. And uh, many have suffered, again, physical, sexual abuse, uh, drug and alcohol problems. They're beginning new lives here. We have what are called homes here. We have 60 individual houses where family couples uh, like foster parents live with the boys and girls here. We have our own schools here in our village. We have our own athletic fields. Father Flanagan had designed our, our field house to look uh, based on the University of Michigan field house. It has an indoor Olympic sized swimming pool, just everything you can imagine to serve children. We have our baseball, football fields, soccer fields, and our village is open to the public in our Catholic chapel every year. We got about Every Sunday, about two to 3,000 people come to worship in the Catholic chapel on campus. Plus, we have our Protestant chapel. And for our Jewish children, there are synagogues nearby where they can go and worship. And uh, further in this image, you can see kind of a field. That was our old farm. We actually sold that about three, four years ago. And that's now a new development. Developers have purchased it. And it's going to be a $1.2 billion development. It's going to be self-contained city within the city of Omaha. It's very unique to see it expanding. Uh, but we no longer needed that farmland. And all those funds now will go to maintain our village because we are a National Historic Landmark District. We're the only one in the state of Nebraska. And we have over 100 historical structures that need to be preserved here. And we're tax exempt, so all that money goes to uh, help uh, preserve that. Uh, Father Flanagan's cause began uh, on March 12th at a mass here at Boys Town. Boys Town itself is not actively promoting it because, again, we are a separate uh, non-sectarian children's home, but there's a group of our Boys Town alumni and Catholics here in the city of Omaha called the Father Flanagan League, and they are the ones that are promoting Father Flanagan's cause. And his cause currently is at the Vatican. The Historical Commission has finished this work, and the Theological Commission is about ready to begin its work, too. Uh, and the, the League is creating a documentary on Father Flanagan's life, which they hope to premiere this, uh, this fall. They've already been filming in, in Ireland, and they just emailed me just a few minutes ago. They're ready to go to Japan the, to do uh, uh, work in Japan, so they are preparing that uh, work. And just going back to our, our village of Boys Town is unique because we have our children living here. We have our own mayor here in the village of Boys Town that is one of, our ch uh, one of the kids. And that Father Flanagan wanted the children to be active that way. And what you see in our village is the tip of the iceberg. Every year, Boys Town serves over 2 million children and families across America. We have a national hotline. We have a huge hospital complex here where we're serving children. And we have various programs from in-home family programs to uh, fostering programs. Just everything you can imagine to help kids and families stay together. And it's all based on the tenet of Father Flanagan that we, uh, we are a family and children are to be loved. And that's what we follow here in the village of Boys Town, uh, concepts that carry on today. And that's one of the things that people from Rome spoke to us about. They said, is Father Flang remembered in the village of Boys Town? And I can guarantee you just about every day, Father Flang is referenced here in the village of Boys Town by our staff and our, our executive director, Father Stephen Bays today, because uh, it's a unique community. And again, we are open to the public. And if anyone would ever like to stop by, 
They can come and visit the community and see how our boys and girls live today and learn the unique history of Father Flanagan, how it began with a borrowed $90 from a Jewish gentleman and now is a world leader in uh, taking care of children around the world. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be willing to answer any questions now about Boys Town, Father Flanagan, or any of our special programs. People can learn more about Boys Town going to boystown.org. That's our official site where you can learn about Father Flanagan's programs and how to be a supporter also. Well, thank you, Tom. That's, that's a fascinating uh, account of, of the life of Father, Father Flanagan and his work. Um, I was thinking as you were making your presentation, there's a, a well-known residential program here in Pennsylvania that was founded on and still survives on the multi, multi-million dollar estate of uh, the founder of a famous chocolate company. Yes. From a lay perspective, you would say that, you know, it's miraculous that a sickly young man who struggled to make it through seminary was able to come up with this idea and bring it to fruition, really just based upon the strength of his will. It is. It's amazing because, again, many people say, where did he get his ideas? Where did he get his concepts? Many of them was, was his life experience. Growing up with his family in Ireland and their strong spiritual life gave him a, a grounding that really helped him to go forward because he had great opposition. He had many failures. Uh, people uh, tried to shut him down several times. He had Ku Klux Klan, people objecting to him, uh, what he was doing, but he kept going forward. And he said, that's what he uh, we had to do. And that's what we follow that today here at Boys Town. We just continue going on based on those ideas because uh, uh, again, it's just amazing that he's able to do that because of the failures. He actually almost went bankrupt twice. The sheriff was on the grounds here to foreclose on the mortgage and then someone would send some money to keep it going. Uh, so he had uh, great uh, tragedy and, and great success too because he even today you look at all of the hundreds of thousands of people that have been impacted by our kids. Over 40,000 children lived here, and now we see their children and their grandchildren come to Boys Town and say if their family member hadn't come here, they wouldn't be as successful they are today. When you watch the movie, which parts of it seem sort of quaint to us now, uh, but they, they really play up the struggle with uh, the mortgages and, and trying to raise money and his friendship with, with Monsky. But that part of the film is actually true, isn't it? It is. Uh, Father Flanagan uh, didn't have any money to start with, and uh, he had to go around and ask people to give him money, beg for money, uh, because he refused to take any money from any religious group again or the community chest, because he said, I want to be independent. Uh, and so he had to go and look for this money, and he had great struggles again. Uh, he would take out mortgages and then build buildings here and then pay off the debt, take out another mortgage. That if That's very true in the movie. Uh, our for many years, the Archbishop of Omaha was the president of our board. It was kind of a courtesy that Father Flanagan did for the Archbishop. And we do have a letter in our archives back in the 1930s. Father wanted to build a new building, and the Archbishop said, no, you can't build it because you don't have enough money. And Father Flanagan wrote to him saying, I'm going to build this building because I raised the money from people from all over America, and you're not going to tell me what to do. This is my home, and I'm going to open it. So he was very forceful in letting people know this was a community that was going to be for kids. And anyone, even an archbishop who was going to hold them back, he was going to speak up and say, respectfully, I am going to continue on with this work. Uh, no, you're not going to, going to stop me. Uh, and that's what he did. And it's amazing the people that came to him. He, uh, when he passed away, we have letters from Masonic organizations, the NAACP, all different groups wrote uh, how sorry, sorry he was gone. Uh, during World War II, he actually took in Japanese Americans. He was opposed to the camps and he actually built homes here and over 200 Japanese Americans eventually uh, were brought from the camps and lived here at the village of Boystown. Uh, worked with Father Flanagan. He helped them to uh, join the military and start new lives outside of Boystown. So he, uh, he just thought it was an injustice to see people were, would be locked up like that. So he actively worked to bring, bring people from the camps. And uh, he said the greatest threat to America was not internal forces or not external forces. It was internal forces that would discriminate against someone because they had the wrong color, worshiped at the wrong altar, or maybe had the wrong occupation. He said that would destroy America more than anything. We've, we've talked in other programs how the uh, Irish immigrants who came here uh, after the great hunger and in successive generations faced a lot of nativist resistance. There was discrimination and prejudice uh, against Catholics generally and Irish Catholics. But when you look at the film in 1938, uh, when it came out, and then a few years later, the Fighting 69th came out with Pat O'Brien, 
um, is sort of was part of, uh, of Irish America being embraced by the culture at large as being sort of quintessentially uh, American. It, it was because when Father Flynn came in 1904, there were signs up and people were saying, no Irish, don't come to our community. Uh, and he encountered that even here in the city of Omaha, even though there's a large Irish and Catholic population here, still there were groups of people here that objected to him because of the Irishness of Father Flanagan. Uh, and again, he had witnessed that in England growing up and he would not, or Ireland with English occupation, he would not stand for it. He said, everyone must be equal. And the movie was his attempt to show that because if you watch the movie Boys Town in there, children are shown praying whatever uh, faith they're praying. Uh, and uh, that movie again, made him a worldwide figure and kind of uh, representing what an Irish Catholic priest should be. Uh, and we have people writing to him wanting to be a supporter. One of them was a gentleman named Father Simpson. And Father Simpson at the time was a seminarian and he was African-American He was, uh, and he wanted to become a priest. And no archdiocese in America would sponsor him at that time. But Father Flanagan said, I will sponsor you. And then he helped him to become a Catholic priest. And we have pictures of fathers at, at his first mass. And so Father Flanagan uh, would do that. He would see any, anyone being discriminated against the race or religion, he tried to step in and, and remedy that uh, whenever he could. Uh, and uh, it was very unique uh, for him to step forward and do that at that time. He put his life in trouble several times because of it, again, working with the Ku Klux Klan, uh, people right, hating what he was doing. You mentioned early in your presentation that, that Father Flanagan perceived that what was lacking in these young people's lives was what a family normally brings, what, what parents normally bring. And I think maybe the most profound thing that you said tonight from my perspective is that uh, 800 or so servicemen entering the United States Armed Forces listed Father Flanagan as their next of kin. That's just a profound statement about what Boys Town meant to these young men. It, it did, and, and even today with our children that come here, uh, their family lives have not been the best for some of them. And when they come here, Boys Town is their only family. And we have an alumni convention where former boys and girls come back now. And to hear the stories of these men and women talking about coming here and for the first time they were in a family style setting where someone actually cared for them and looked out for them and loved them because that's the uh, what we practice here with our children going back to father flanagan he had no problem saying love he would say love to the boys all the time and many of the children had never had that before even today with our kids you'll see some of the hardest children come to us and then after a few months they realize no one here is going to hurt them no one is going to exploit them and they're going to going to live here as a family. And it goes all back to Father Flanagan. He said the basis for a child had to be a family setting. And he wanted children to live here, but for a short time. And he wanted them to go back home again if they could. And that's why today in our village, the average stay for our kids is about 18 months. Some are here longer, some are here shorter. It just depends on our boys and girls and they come to live with us. And we actually on campus have established a psychiatric hospital. We have children here age nine to 18. And these are boys and girls that uh, have such extreme behavior behaviors, they can't live at home. So they're being tre having treatment here on campus, all again, based on Father Flanagan's series and concept of love. And he learned that again with his Irish family in that little cottage back in Ballymo, Ireland, is where he learned these skills of how to work as a family and have a good spiritual life. And that's what we encourage with our boys and girls today, too. We encourage them to have a spiritual life when they live with us. Now, some of our viewers may not be fully familiar with the process uh, of how one might become a saint, the canonization process. Could you give us just a quick overview of what the steps are and how that proceeds? Uh, the, our, the, the, the steps begin, you have to have a ground well, a groundswell of support. So there has to be documentation. There's a group of people, a uh, large group of people that really feel this individual possibly could be looked at to become a saint. So that was carried out for several years here in the city of Omaha by a group of individuals. They took the documentation they had to the local archbishop and said, here we have this documentation. People would like Father Flanagan to be a saint. So the bishop then took this in consideration. He consulted with the other archbishops in the region and said, do you feel that based on the life of Father Flanagan and his ministry, he could possibly be looked at to be a saint? And our local archbishop received positive responses from local archbishops in the uh, surrounding the uh, state of Nebraska. And so at that point, then he began the process of having the mass and Father Flanagan be being declared a servant of God. And our postulator came to us. His name was Dr. Ambrosi from Rome, and he's working with the group. And uh, when he came to us, 
he uh, helped them to guide the group through the process. And now they have to, again, continue that groundswell of support and people praying to Father Flanagan. We had to create documents showing Father Flanagan's life. And in the Hall of History, we have 3 million documents of uh, dealing with Father Flanagan. We had to pare it down to about 10,000 and send that documentation in his theological writings to Rome to be reviewed. And that's the Vatican has come back and they have historically uh, uh, accepted the, the documents. They are correct and they, they permit that to go forward. So now the Theological Commission will review Father Flanagan's writings. And if a, if a miracle comes along at that point, Father possibly, God willing, could be a servant of God. And then after that, uh, another miracle will need to take place in, in the, uh, with Father Flanagan's help. And then he could be at that point beatified. So it's a process that takes many years, uh, long years of dedication. And again, it's a group being carried out. Uh, lay people, lay Catholics in the city of Omaha that are doing it. I've been permitted to help with it because as a historian for Boys Town, I'm in charge of the archives and Father Flanagan's writings, so I'm able to help with that. Uh, but beyond that, Boys Town gives no funding for it. Uh, it's totally up to these individuals to raise the funds and promote Father's cause. Uh, and when Dr. Ambrosi came from Rome, uh, he was amazed by our village of Boys Town. He said, you already have the documents created, organized. You have a museum for Father Flanagan in place. So he said, you have cut 35 years off the process just by the work we had done here at Boys Town uh, and, and organizing Father Flanagan's life. So that made us feel really good that all the work we've been doing for years here was actually paying off. And they've told us that Father Flanagan is made a saint. We could expect half a million to a million people a year coming into the village of Boys Town uh, to see potentially a Father Flanagan shrine. And all of this, again, is just based on uh, uh, God. You know, There's nothing we can do. This is all in the hands of God in the Vatican to see if Father Flanagan is made a saint. And you noted that even though he was very busy with his uh, very specific life's work, Father Flanagan was an active member of the Irish community uh, there in Nebraska, and in fact, a member of our own order, the Ancient Order of Hibernians. He, he was, he was a Hibernian, and he would go to the meetings. Uh, we have pictures of him at the meetings, and then he would travel across America, and he went to Houston, Texas one St. Patrick's Day and he was greeted by the Hibernians there. And we have a picture of him with a bunch of shamrocks when he arrived. Uh, he would go home to Ireland several times and tour Ireland and, and uh, discussed Irish independence. We, in his, uh, he created a newsletter for Boys Town. Uh, and in 1919, he was writing a document stating Ireland should be free. So he was a great advocate for Irish independence and uh, worked for it his entire life. And again, he and Mr. De Valera remained friends and when Father Flanagan made a visit to Ireland in 1946, we have him photographed together at, when they met in Dublin. So Father Flanagan was a great champion for Irish independence. And if you come to the village of Boys Town, uh, we do Irish Christmas every year in his home. You can go into his, his restored historic museum. It's not a historic house museum. Every Christmas, we decorate it with Irish Christmas traditions. And you'll see uh, uh, he put a huge Celtic cross on the administration building here on campus. And then you'll see the Irish flag flying because our sister city is his hometown of Ballymo, Ireland. And so we celebrate our Irishness uh, every day here in the village of Boys Town. That's just uh, wonderful. And uh, your presentation tonight uh, was, was fantastic and very informative. And I don't know, Danny, do we have any questions coming in? Well, we're, com we're coming to the end of our time, but I'd like to ask a couple real quick. What, and, and I wasn't able to catch the math and do it quick enough. How old was he when he was finally ordained? Father Flanagan was ordained. He was about in his late 20s when he was finally ordained because he had failed at the three seminaries. And then eventually he founded Boys Town when he was about 32 years old. That's a great lesson in perseverance, not just for the uh, the boys, but for all of us. And um, the today, how many residents are in Boys Town? Uh, today in our village, we have around 300 boys and girls living with us. We're the largest residential care facility in the United States for at-risk uh, at children. And they're from all over the United States and uh, they're here for treatment. Uh, some are from very wealthy families, some are from very poor families. Some of the kids have been in gangs. Uh, some of our children have been sexually trafficked, uh, trafficked. It's just a whole variety of children coming here and they're beginning a new life. And if you were to come and see them, uh, it's just amazing because they go to school here. We have our sports program. We have cheerleaders, arts programs, music. It's just like a normal high school. And, and the kids, after they're here for a few months, it's just amazing to see how they, uh, how they changed. Uh, our current student worker, we have kids who work with us after school in our projects. His name is uh, Timothy. And his grandfather immigrated from Ireland. And so when he came to work for us, they saw, 
that's a perfect connection that you would work, work here at the Hall of History with your Irish history too. So it's a, it's a unique community, but we have children here of all races and all backgrounds come to live with us in village of Boys Town. Now it goes back to Father Flanagan. He said, all children were welcome here from the very beginning in 1917, we've welcomed children uh, to come and live here and worship. It's, uh, it's uh, remarkable. Now, it, at this time as a co-ed, Yes, we've had girls here at Boys Town since 1979. So our population oh. is about 50-50 uh, boys and girls. And the girls have their own homes here and the boys have their homes, but they all go to school together, just like a normal high school uh, setting. Last question for me is, uh, what was the highest number of boys at its peak? Uh, back in about 1950s, we had over 900 boys living on the grounds here. Father Flang had never lived to see it reach that, that high <clears throat> to passed away. But we had over 900 boys here all the way up to about the 1960s. And that's when we had to change our program to the program we have today, which is our family individually based program. Because at that time, the boys were living in dormitories. And the issues children are facing today are such that they need one on one attention. We actually have MRI machines here. And we're having a study done with our kids to see how we can help them. Because some of our children come to us and are on heavy medications for uh, uh, different issues in their lives. And we're trying to help them get over that. And that's all based on Father Flanagan's idea. He said, you got to keep evolving and changing. And that's what we continue to do with our Boys Town programs today. We're always coming up with new ideas and concepts to reach kids. Because that's what he did as director. He kept changing and evolving the program to help kids. And I, I see you have a pin on there. Is that a Father Flanagan pin? It is. It's our Father Flanagan pin, and it's based on a portrait of Father Flanagan, which is our official portrait of Father. And that uh, image was put on the Pasitio when it was presented to the Vatican. And you'll see that uh, throughout the village of Boystown. Uh, it's eventually going to be traveling to Ireland because in his hometown of Ballymo, uh, a new museum is going to open for Father Flanagan this August. Uh, it's in the old rectory where he would visit as a child right next to St. Crone's, his, his church he grew up in. Uh, and that should be opening on August 28th in Ballymo, Ireland. Uh, the day before, Nebraska plays football. So that's kind of, it's all tied in together. So a group of us are traveling from Nebraska to watch Nebraska play Northwestern at Aviva Stadium. And then we're going to travel down to the village to open the new Father Flanagan Museum. That's incredible. Well, this all came about, and I'm, I'm, I think Dan's aware of this. This all came about with a conversation between you and Sean Pender when he was out in that area and his many travels now that he's retired. Uh, and now they call it Sean's Town. But Sean wasn't able to link in video-wise, but he was able to get on audio. So, Sean, uh, take it away. Good Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. President and Dan, for setting up these great programs. And, uh, Tom, it is so good to uh, to see you and, and listen to you again. That, uh, uh, you know, intensity you bring to this program was so evident when I when I went out there. And, and it, it, it's, it was just really inspiring. Uh, I, I knew of Boys Town growing up and my family was a big lover of the movie. Uh, they loved Spencer Tracy in my house. Um, but to see the work that they still go on and, and how it was, you know, started by a simple man, despite his, his problems, uh, who, who had problems, but belief simple. That there's no such thing as a bad kid. That treat everyone the way you wanted to be treated. I had a laugh when we were out there. At one time, I believe they brought the Christian brothers in who seemed to be a little bit on the, um, the more strict side. And Father Flanagan actually said, no, that's not the way we, we, we do it here. But uh, I think that inspiration of a simple man shows us all what, we, what can be accomplished. And it, it would be great to, to pray for him or ask him to pray for us as well. And I just wanted to add that it was my first time in, in Omaha and I was greeted by uh, Mike Aidy, the uh, local uh, past local president, also the state president of Nebraska. And I think that spirit of Father Flanagan also inspires our division out there because they do some tremendous, tremendous work. And especially when it comes to hunger, the numbers that they put out there, uh, please pass back again to all the brothers out there. Congratulations on the great work. And I'm so glad that we can continue to tell the story of a, of a great former mem member who hopefully one day will be a state. And thank you, Thomas. I hope to see you again someday, someday in the future. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any closing uh, comments, Thomas? I would like to thank you for allowing me to uh, talk about Father Flanagan. I love to do that because he's such a unique individual. And it's part of our heritage here at Boystown, our Irish heritage, my own personal heritage. And being a Hibernian and seeing he was a Hibernian, what can happen by one individual, again, as Sean said, it's very inspiring. And I would, again, encourage everyone to come and visit Boystown if you want to and see it for yourself. 
Thank you so much. Uh, Brother Taylor, closing comments? Yeah, I just want to thank everyone on our AOH team for supporting and putting this program together. And, and Brother Lynch, thank you so much again for really an informative and, and uplifting uh, program by Father Flanagan. Thank you. This is a great um, a great hour segment, Thomas. Uh, we're going to share this out to all our divisions. Uh, this will be a great thing for people to watch after division meetings, before division meetings. But most importantly, everyone who's on here tonight, this is on our YouTube channel. It'll be live. Or it'll be available in minutes after we're done here today. Share it with your friends. Uh, it's very tough. After COVID, uh, a year ago, we had a captive audience and uh, deciding when to go live and so forth. A lot more challenging um, now that God has uh, opened it up and we're, we're back at it uh, for St. Patrick's Day. But this is something special. Share this. Take a minute. Also share the video that Neil put together for Irish American Heritage Month. Um, that has touched over 600,000 people um, since it came out on the first of the month. Uh, congratulations, Brother Cosgrove. On with us tonight, uh, uh, I introduced Chris Cook earlier who got us started and Tim Noonan's helping us close out. Uh, Tim uh, is in Chicago, uh, does a great job there uh, with so many, there he is. Um, Tim, let me uh, actually show you to everyone so they'll know I'm not making you up. But uh, Tim is uh, does a great work. And we're going to come back after Irish American Heritage Month, and we're going to be bring back by popular demand um, Hibernian Talks, where Tim will visit with some authors. And uh, we have a couple. I know our Freedom for Ireland tours meeting with two, maybe three in Ireland. I'm going to meet with one in Ireland. And so we're going to come back with some work for uh, Tim beyond his uh, technical work. That being said, thank you all for joining us. We're gonna close out with a uh, another showing of that incredible video for Irish American Heritage Month. Stand by. A journalist visiting America in 1860 wrote, there are several kinds of power working at the fabric of this Republic, water power, steam power, and Irish power. The last works hardest of all. Irish Americans continue to power America, from building our infrastructure, to healing the sick, to rushing into harm's way as others run out. Irish names are prominent on all our rolls of valor, including 257 recipients of the Medal of Honor that list Ireland as their birthplace. Without Irish Americans, Helen Keller would not have had her miracle worker. The marginalized would have lost a voice we would not have been challenged to reach for the moon. But the most significant contribution of Irish Americans is the story of a people who arrived from their homeland with little more than energy and determination, who have contributed and excelled in every aspect of American society, defining the American dream. March is Irish American Heritage Month. Say it's all right.